Hi guys, before the start of the episode, I wanted to give a quick disclaimer that if you are currently in recovery for an eating disorder or if you are struggling with an eating disorder, this episode might not be the one for you. There will be talk surrounding weight loss, nutrition, and food, and so this could be triggering for some individuals. If you are currently struggling and don't have any resources to look to, I highly recommend checking out www.eatingdisorderhope.com or talking about it with a trusted parent, guardian, or loved one. Now, without further ado, Let's get into the episode. What a wonderful Hi guys and welcome back to Real. Today we are taking live into a podcast, into an actual podcast episode um, because we have one of our live panelists here with us, uh, Miss Paige Hyden. She is a dietitian and she talks a lot about mindfulness, mindful eating, um, and also helps people in recovery and people with weight loss in general. So we are very excited to have her on the pod today. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so excited. This has been such a fun morning already coming into New York. <laughs> I know. I love it. So she's um, she lives in Hoboken for those. Can we say that? Yeah. She's a Hoboken girly, which we love. Um, but but you're a work from home girly, which is great. Yes. I want you to tell everyone um, before we like rehash the live show a little because we obviously have to how you got started into what you do, where you work and just a little bit about you and your story. Okay. So I, like Carly mentioned, I work fully remote now um, for a virtual private practice called Kulina Health. I'm sure we'll talk more about Mm -hmm. it throughout. Um, It is a practice that accepts all major insurance plans. So it's been awesome to really serve the 99% Mm -hmm. and access many, many people with many different reasons for visit. That was a big draw to the company that I've had for a while. Um, But fully virtual, full-time, seeing one-to-one patients all day Um, and Tuesdays this is a Tuesday morning recording I just start later which is really nice Um, but I'm loving it so far I started in August so coming up on almost a year which is kind of almost crazy but really happy there and I got into nutrition long story short um, I was an athlete growing up and I was a soccer player I was getting to the point of potentially taking soccer to the next level on a collegiate level Mm -hmm and was struggling with stamina. This was around middle school. I was pretty young. It was like eighth grade, but at that time, it's probably even younger now, which is crazy. But at that time, it was already kind of being talked about through coaches. Like, is this something that you want to pursue? Could you go to training camps or could you like be seen at events by college coaches? And I was interested, but a coach pulled me aside and was basically like, gave it to me straight at a pretty young age and was like, if you don't improve your stamina, Without saying, he said it without saying it. Basically, if you don't lose weight and get in better shape, you are not going to play collegiate soccer. Yeah, because I was going to say stamina, that like, how does that, yeah, with weight, like. Yeah, stamina meaning I couldn't stay on the field for a long time. I was literally getting to the point where after like 10 or 12 minutes, I would have to be pulled off or I would slow down. I would like not be able to keep up with people. Okay. Um, And I kind of realized it, but the skill for me was there. So I was still getting playing time. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking it was a problem. Mm Mm-hmm until this was brought to my attention. And luckily, I didn't take that and develop an eating disorder Mm -hmm. or just spiral mentally. I basically took that and I was like, okay, here's my homework. I want to play soccer. This Mm -hmm. is my dream. I'm going to figure out how to do this. And my mom took me to Weight Watchers, which again is like a crazy point in my story. Like I still, nothing negative came from it. Mm -hmm. Um, Only positive. I think Weight Watchers has changed a lot um, over time. But Mm -hmm. I basically just started eating more fruits and vegetables from it, practicing portion control. Mm -hmm. And as many dietitians, even at that age, I'm a very data-oriented, numbers, structured, type A person. And it was a point, it was just counting points. And I picked up, really nothing disordered from it Mm. outside of fruit and vegetables are free. Lean proteins are pretty decent. Whole grains at the time, I don't know now, like all the healthy nutrient dense foods Mm. were just lower in points. So Mm. I was naturally being an active kid, losing weight. Mm. I was also going through puberty, like growing at the time. So I think part of it was just like natural that I grew a few inches at that time too. Yeah. But lo and behold, I was improving my stamina and I ended up going to Gettysburg College. I don't think we've ever talked about this. Yeah, um, I ended up going it. to Gettysburg College, a small school in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Got injured three seconds in, like mm. a 
practice into preseason, I was fully injured and ended up quickly transferring to Delaware. But I always thought I wanted to be a sports dietitian because of my story. Right. And kind of through pretty early on shadowing and learning more about career options, I realized that as a sports dietitian, it's weekends, holidays, horrible hours, not great cultures from Mm. what I had heard. So I kind of shifted that and really just had an open mind. I started mm-hmm. working at a hospital in New Jersey right out of school. You had to complete as a dietitian. I'm sure we'll get into this too. Mm-hmm. You have to complete a lot of hospital hours, yeah. clinical hours. Started working there, pivoted to a lot of different roles in a short amount of time mm-hmm. and just kind of realized through my roles that I loved private practice. I loved spending time with patients, mm-hmm. which is what I do now. Yeah. Um, but after the hospital, I transferred to more of a concierge medicine role. I was really serving like the 1%. Everything was out of network, very expensive services, mm-hmm. um, very high level executives I was serving. And I was like, I love the counseling, but I really want to reach just the normal people, mm-hmm. the public. Um, so now I really get that demographic, bigger, bigger access. Um, which is great. And that's, I guess, a little bit into how I got here. Um, But I've definitely, and I've only been a dietitian for about three years. I've Mm -hmm. had three or four different jobs. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Yeah, And I feel like that's kind of when you're starting out, especially like moving to New York or moving to like any city, you kind of bounce around like figuring out where your place is and like what the right place for you is. Um, I want to go back a little bit. It's so interesting how you talked about um, a, your mom bringing you to Weight Watchers because it was crazy. I was brought to Weight Watchers back when I was in high school. Um, I wasn't overweight or anything. I just like wanted to lose weight and my mom brought okay. me to Weight Watchers and they sent me away um, and said, wow. you can't be here because um, I was under 18 and interesting. Yeah. So and they told I. me, yeah, they told me I wasn't allowed. I couldn't. So that was a interesting, like, interesting. yeah, but it is crazy that you're, you say like you only got healthy habits out of it. Why do you think that was? Do you think you're because you're programmed more in like in numbers and points, you didn't attach it to your body as much or because you you never struggled as much with the body image aspect? You were kind of doing it for a sports purpose. Like yeah. why do you think because like as you know, you're working with people like this all the time it is so common, especially for a young person. Like it's a risky, it's a thing that you really have to tread lightly with. For sure. I was such a confident young child. Mm. I don't know if some of that had to do with being so active and Mm. being in the spotlight at a young age, I guess you could say, especially as I got older in high school, like playing soccer for my town was a big deal, if you will. But I feel like even growing up, I was just like, the loud one I was always the one like running around screaming in everyone's faces as a kid and I never felt ashamed of my body Mm -hmm. ever I never Mm -hmm. struggled with body image even when the coach said that I wasn't I just took it as my assignment Mm -hmm. which is very odd I would say especially at that age I think now with like social media and everything that would have been clouding my head about it it would have been a different story but I really did not struggle in that area even as I started to see my body changing I didn't take the turn the other way either I Mm -hmm. didn't become obsessive with it I kind of just halted like Mm -hmm. I got to a place where I was performing well Mm -hmm. and fueling well and that's where that sports nutrition piece came in I then was like kind of shadowing and learning relatively like how much to eat or what to eat before or after a game things like that um which I think helped as well because I wanted to perform well I didn't want to start being like sluggish and not have stomach because I wasn't eating enough which I remember like thinking about making sure I was having sports drinks and Mm -hmm. like eating little snacks here and there Mm -hmm. but I definitely things took a turn later in my life through diet culture which I think it speaks to the social media aspect too and Mm -hmm. just as I entered the career there was much more pressure at that time I feel still as a dietitian to look a certain way, which mm. is really challenging. Yeah. There's dietitians, and I'm sure we'll get there, like all across the spectrum, not only in what they believe in, but what we look like. Yeah. Um, I think, though, when I was going through college and majored in this field, once I stopped playing soccer, I gained a lot of weight again because mm. my activity really dropped, but I ate the same. Right. It was like freshman 25, 30. Yeah, yeah. And that period, I would say, was like body image struggles. Yeah. Was 
leaving a hard relationship at the time, was transferring a lot of change, and was just faced with diet culture like many of us are in their later teens, Mm -hmm. I would say. I grew up as a competitive gymnast and have a very similar experience with, like I was doing it through high school. I was like on my varsity team. And when I got injured, I tore my ACL. When I had my injury and I stopped, I couldn't compete or, or practice that's when I developed my worst issues because it's almost like we had control. We had the built-in sport. And like Mm -hmm. you said, like we could eat whatever we wanted. Like Mm -hmm. we weren't thinking as much about it. And then you stop and all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, I have to like think about this. Yeah. Um, What, like when you were kind of spiraling into like the diet culture, what was going on? Like what were some of the kind of like symptoms or things that were going on with you? Like how did it play out in your life? So I, it's a pretty interesting experience and I'm not going to name names, yeah. but I interned for a dietitian in mm-hmm. college. Mm-hmm. I had selected dietetics as a major and I was, as a lot of dietitians, I'm even getting outreach now, which is mm-hmm. so cool, like roles being reversed of people yeah. wanting to shadow me. But that's just what you have to do in college. You have to get experience. It's never paid and it's just to learn and kind of expose yourself to different environments. Um, so I interned for a dietitian and this dietitian promotes a very rigid, strict diet. Mm -hmm. And as a dietitian to be, or someone like that I thought I wanted to be like, I started to really just look up to this person and Mm -hmm. this brand, if you will, um, and started following this diet Mm -hmm. as an intern. And started at that time, it was after the weight gain in college, and it was like kind of the perfect storm, I would Mm -hmm. say. I dropped a lot of weight really fast, and I was doing it from dietitians, so it felt very valid. Mm-hmm. I never questioned anything about it, um, but I was I was very, very rigid with what I was eating and what I wasn't eating, what I was drinking. I was a college student, like vodka soda only, like never anything else could enter my bloodstream. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until I started to excel more into more classes where we actually had to do a diet analysis mm-hmm. on ourselves. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking going into it, like, my diet's going to be amazing. I'm following this plan that a dietitian made. I'm managing my weight. I'm eating so much fiber. I'm eating such balanced meals. And I did a diet analysis. And my teacher asked me to meet with her after um, the assignment was due, like, a few days later. And she said, you did this assignment wrong. I just, like, we need to walk through it. We need to do it together. Like, you're eating 800 calories a day. I was like, no, no, I write every morsel down Uh, that I eat. This is not wrong. This is what I eat. There's nothing wrong with it. And she, it was literally a moment I, I I literally was in panic because as a dietitian as well, I care about my health. I want to be safe. I, I never would have done something that I felt would have been harmful. I just didn't, I didn't know enough. Mm -hmm. Like I was literally a sophomore. And by the time I was a senior doing this project, I was still loosely following this Mm plan. And she really sat me down and she was like, okay, here are the basics of metabolism and here's what's going to happen to you if you keep doing this. Mm -hmm. And then I started looking around and expanding my like very like focused vision Mm -hmm. on this plan. I was Mm -hmm. only following this plan or influencers or other people who are following this plan. And then I started to zoom out and I just started like looking on Instagram, like what are other dietitians doing? Because they can't all be doing this. This wouldn't make any sense. And then I started like thinking about, oh my God, like spiraling. Mm -hmm. Everyone else is eating so differently and like so much more. Mm. I'm going to gain weight if I eat more. I can't eat more. So I later in my career, which I'm proud to say, I started working for a dietitian. Her name is Alex. And I started really aligning with what she was saying, but also I was very scared. It was like, I feel like my own patience at that time, like I was eating back, exposing myself back to carbs and foods and fats and fruit, like, Mm so minimally yeah but slowly over a really long time I was able to I think because of the knowledge that I had from that professor and just like my schooling Mm -hmm. and also the help of this dietitian and other people I was starting to expose myself to I was like okay I have to I have to get out of this and recover from this like I'm going into this field Mm -hmm. I have to do this the right way yeah but it was a really crazy challenging experience yeah as a student trying to do this yeah it's I almost think and like I know that it's obviously a negative thing that it happened to you but I think it gives you so much more knowledge and so much more compassion now in your field like you're able to look at things from a lens of like 
is this person suffering from an eating disorder? Um, like, does what are these person's habits? Like, how can we change them and improve them? And you come at it from a, a healthier perspective, I think, because of what you went through. Um, so now talk about how that affected who your clients are now and how you treat your clients. Um, yeah. Because obviously, like you said, there are so many different dietitians out there and there are so many different kind of sectors of like what different people believe. And I know the diet industry in general, there's a lot of different beliefs and it can be a slippery slope of like what you align with. Um, so yeah, can you talk a little bit about kind of maybe the different areas and where you align yourself? Yeah, I think my story plays a role in that. Um, I, to disclose, do not work with patients who have eating disorders actively, but I do work with a lot of patients who are longer down the road of recovery, who identify as recovered from their eating disorder, but still experience disordered eating behaviors, Mm. habits, trickling thoughts. If it ever gets to the point where the trickling thoughts become loud thoughts, Mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if this is a line that's being crossed into a basically relapse, Mm -hmm. I guess, would you call it? Um, I always coordinate care with a dietitian on my team who works with that population um, to serve them best. But the spectrum of dietitians is pretty wide. It's, it ranges from kind of what I experienced of, which is a smaller sector, I would say, but super rigid rules, you know, follow this plan, avoid certain foods, really limit certain foods, um, very weight loss, intentional weight loss, 100% of the time, pretty driven. And then there's the entire other side of the spectrum, which we talked a lot about at our live event Mm -hmm. um, of intuitive eating dietitians. I would put also in this end of the spectrum, health at every size dietitians, body positive dietitians. I think body neutrality could fall over there, but it's probably more so in the middle. Um, These dietitians do not ever promote intentional weight loss. If you are focused on weight loss in any way, shape or form, that dietitian is not going to serve you or you're going to start working with them and you're going to realize that your weight loss is no longer an intentional goal for you and you're focused more on health promoting behaviors Mm -hmm. and mindset. And um, there's a lot of overlap in what we would talk about no Mm -hmm. matter where we fall, but I really fall in the middle and that is serving a bit of everyone. I would say I cater to direct counseling style data driven You could count calories with me. You could step on a scale every day with me. You could follow a structured plan, but it's not going to avoid any food group. It's not going to have a list of foods you can eat, foods you can't. It's going to be a very sustainably built plan Mm -hmm. for you based on preferences, access, things like that. I also work with a ton of patients who would never, ever do any of that, what I just named, who may have a weight loss goal, but once we recognize their relationship with food is in a really low place that has to be the priority and that has to be the goal and we're focused a lot on navigating how to honor our hunger and fullness what is what does hunger and fullness feel like Mm -hmm. um really working on body neutrality building our emotional toolbox to really help cope to food less or use Mm -hmm. food as an escape less do we ever get to weight loss with those patients sometimes but not for a long time typically because the relationship with food is a really fragile long journey I would say yeah and a lot of the time with I I can relate obviously for me like I just don't think personally weight loss can ever be something I pursue because anytime I've tried to pursue it I crash and burn when it comes to that stuff um so I can relate to like the you're like oh it's an option but we have to focus on like healing the relationship. I think it's so important. And obviously there's going to be another disclaimer in the beginning of this, but if you've, if you're currently suffering from an eating disorder, if you're in recovery, this like probably isn't the episode for you. Um, and recommend listening to a different one. But I, the reason that I think it's so important to have dietitians like you coming on and being in like the eye of like a Gen Z kind of crowd is because people are going to want to pursue weight loss no matter what. I think it's like telling um, kids in high school not to drink. Mm -hmm. They're going to do it anyways. So how can we provide an environment for them to do it as safely as possible? Mm -hmm. With diet culture, with our society, like just with everything going on in society, 
there's a lot of dangerous diets out there, like what you were doing, like, you know, things that I've done in the past. So it's like, if you're going to pursue weight loss, if you, there, like, there's always a safer way to do something. And it's like so important where you're getting your information from. If this, like, cause I can't stop anyone from pursuing weight loss, but I can provide them tools for safety and like for healthy weight loss. So what are like some initial tools? And also, is there like a t- type of patient that you won't treat? Like if someone, does someone have to be overweight for you to treat them? Um, does someone have to be obese? Like what is like the qualifications? I currently work with, I mentioned sustainable weight loss, mm. which we'll get more into like what, qual- what yeah. does that mean? Yeah. Disordered eating. I also work with a lot of patients who present with Mm pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, Mm -hmm. maybe um, status post uh, heart attack or stroke. Mm -hmm. Um, Also patients with high cholesterol, high triglycerides. And I also work with athletes a little bit now, which Mm -hmm. is fun to kind of full circle bring that in. I um, help patients who may be training for a marathon or power lifters, but to qualify for any of that, there really is not a standard of qualification for sustainable weight mm-hmm. loss to answer that portion of the question. Mm-hmm. Does somebody need to have a BMI of overweight or obese to help them reach their aesthetic goals? Mm-hmm. No. I have a lot of patients who are at healthy BMIs mm-hmm. who are looking to lose a minimal, arguably, amount of weight, maybe five pounds, maybe 10 pounds, maybe 15 pounds. And for those patients, is their relationship with food and body in a neutral space? If yes, here's how we can do this in a really healthy way to get you feeling like you are living your happiest, healthiest life in a body that you feel really confident in. I, I would never recommend pushing the limit with that of even though BMI isn't everything and body mass index is not an awesome marker of much if someone is heading towards an underweight BMI or is presenting at an underweight BMI or presenting really close to it and comes to me for sustainable weight loss that's typically a presentation of relationship with food Mm -hmm. and body issues Mm -hmm. maybe an underlying eating disorder that Mm -hmm. has never been diagnosed not always possibly but typically in that scenario or if their BMI is super low normal it's going to be about general healthy eating habits optimizing their diet and nutrition but it's going to be really about promoting overall health Mm -hmm. and making sure they're fueling their body well. So it's a mixed bag. I also have a lot of patients who present in class one, two, three obesity Mm -hmm. of BMIs above 30, above 35, above 40. Mm -hmm. Some of them may be on GLP-1 medications like a Wagovi, Ozempic, ZepBound, um, and that's very layered as well. Some of them may also be presenting with diabetes, with high cholesterol, with kidney disease. Like there could be a lot of other things going on. Not always. Sometimes it's literally just they're on these medications for weight loss. They have nothing else going on. Mm -hmm. There's typically relationship with food issues there. So there's always overlap. I mean, I could think of not many patients of mine who come to me with a complete neutral relationship with food, looking to lose weight in a healthy way. Please give me the plan. Thank you. Goodbye. Right. So with relationship with food, what is your process? Like, how are we, someone comes to you and they're like, I'm an emotional eater. Um, I've struggled with yo-yo dieting my entire life. I'm literally just using myself as an example. Yeah. Um, like, like my, my example would be probably a prime example for a patient that comes in, like someone who has struggled with emotional eating their whole life or who has yo-yoed a lot, weight has fluctuated the same 10, 15 pounds a lot. Um, I come in, what, how are you helping me get back to a more neutral place with food? I look at foods as good and bad. Um, I feel guilty a lot around foods. What is the process? How are you helping and, and advice for people that are listening, um, who are struggling with their relationship with food? I'd say that's the majority of my patients. If mm-hmm. I had to group, what do I see the most of? Yeah. Um, and it's really challenging. Everyone's going to require a different style, a different plan, I would say, a different approach and really meeting someone where they are in terms of if they will value and respond well to a direct style or a more gentle style is really important. But either scenario, a lot of this starts, and again, this was covered a little bit in our live show too, a lot of this really starts with 
building structure around your eating patterns Mm -hmm. before we get to conversations around if weight loss is on the table or if it's not. And if you're having struggling thoughts around good foods, bad foods, previous history of dieting, yo-yo diets, yo-yo weight, um, what are you eating? Can we Mm -hmm. start there? Can we get your baseline? Are you skipping meals? Are you in any sort of routine when it comes to meal patterns, snack patterns Mm -hmm. throughout the day? Are you going really long between your meals, whether that's intentional or a busy New Yorker running around the city going to crazy fun things? Is it intentional or is it unintentional? Because if we go too long without eating, that's going to cause what we may see as emotional eating or Mm -hmm. craving, but you're probably just hungry. So I think leaning into structure, building a plan, meeting you where you are in terms of what's going to be in that plan, like what foods do you like, what foods do you have access Mm -hmm. to, what times throughout the day is realistic for you to be eating, um, what does that look like, how convenient do you need this to be, do you need some sort of meal delivery service? Do you need healthy takeout options around? Mm -hmm. Do you dine out a lot? What does that look like? Um, But in that process kind of morphed as well with the structure. How are you in tune to your hunger and fullness I think is huge. And for a lot of people presenting, that's a question I ask and it's like silence. Mm -hmm. How do you know when you're hungry? How do you know when you're full? What does it feel like to be neutral? And how often are you on either end of that spectrum? And for most patients, new to presentation it's I'm hungry all the time right I always feel hungry like is that not normal because I always feel hungry and it's like you're not eating enough Mm -hmm. probably and then you're overeating later Mm -hmm. or you're not eating enough of the things that we need combined like what makes a balanced Mm -hmm. meal what should you be snacking on because you should be snacking I'm a big snack promoter Mm -hmm. for most of my patients Um, it's likely most of the time there's nothing wrong with you there's nothing going on systematically most of the time Mm -hmm. it's like what are we doing at baseline and Mm -hmm. what could we tailor first Mm -hmm. to clean up a little bit and then let's tune back in okay how are you feeling now so if someone comes in and they're complaining I know so many of my friends and like everyone who says this like I'm always hungry like I'm literally starving all the time or you know, as women, especially hormonally, we Mm -hmm. always have certain days of the month or certain weeks of the month where we feel a lot hungrier than other times. What are some little tweaks in your diet that you can do so you don't have that constant feeling of like, I am starving constantly? Yes. Not always, but I would say a large majority of this population may or may not be eating anything in the morning. Mm -hmm. And that may be out of intention or unintentionally, Mm -hmm. like I'm not hungry in the morning. My stomach hurts in the morning. I'm an early workout person. I can't eat anything or I fast. Mm -hmm. I hear less and less of that, to be honest with you. The fasting seems to have trickled a little bit. I hope, I hope it Um, has because I'm really over it. Yeah, same. (laughs) I like open my eyes and I'm starving. I don't know if you're like that, but I think a huge tip of advice to start with is if you're not eating a balanced breakfast or if you're eating a breakfast that's not the most balanced, how ca- let's start there. Mm-hmm. Because the morning meal kicks off the day. It revs up metabolism. It gets you going. Are you eating a meal that has high fiber carbohydrates um, like oatmeal, mm-hmm. um, protein? Maybe that's to give an example. Maybe you're putting Greek yogurt in your protein or maybe you're mixing protein powder in it or mm-hmm. I tell some of my patients as an advanced example, you could even whisk egg whites if you have like egg white um, liquid and mm-hmm. you could mix that into your oatmeal as it's cooking if you're mm-hmm. not someone who loves protein powder, if you don't tolerate yogurt. Um, and then are you getting healthy fat? Could mm-hmm. we sprinkle some chia seeds or flax seeds or nuts or nut butter drizzled on top? You could also add berries, add fruit, add color, antioxidants. If that sounds to most people, it's like, whoa, yeah. that is way too much. If yeah. you tell me to eat that, I'm going to gain weight. Like mm-hmm. absolutely not. So a lot of times it's like, We're not ready for that. So Mm -hmm. we'll start a little bit small. Like, can we eat something? Can we eat a piece of fruit with some nut butter? Like Mm -hmm. a little snack, Mm -hmm. a little protein bar on the go, if that's what you like, or a protein shake on the go, something Mm -hmm. quick, convenient. So I think a morning meal is huge. I also think a big thing in the beginning would be paying attention to that time. If you are someone who goes so long without eating and that's all you know, but you always struggle with your hunger how's three to four hour window? And that doesn't need to look like a meal, a big thing every three to four Mm -hmm. hours, but could we maybe start with small frequent meals and snacks depending on what that looks like and just frequently fueling a little bit more intentionally, Mm -hmm. um, which I think could be a helpful place to start. What are the little like snacks that you recommend throughout the day? Um, Yeah, what are like some of those little things that you can snack on that are gonna keep you full? 
This is a big one too. I think a lot of um, patients at first are snacking. A lot of it's office snacking. That's a huge Mm. thing. Like I just, there's snacks at the office and I'm eating them all day long. A lot of these snacks are going to be rich in carbohydrates, Mm -hmm. which carbs are not bad. Carbs are great. Let the world know. But we want to be pairing carbohydrate rich foods for snack Mm -hmm. with something that has a little bit of protein or fat Mm -hmm. to really stabilize your hunger, keep you a little bit fuller for longer stabilize blood sugar Mm -hmm. it's going to feel smoother so this could be Mm mid-morning mid-afternoon or both depending on your preference or your goals this could to give you some examples as far as the carbohydrate family Mm -hmm. this could be a piece of fruit that would act as your carbohydrate Mm -hmm. this could be a bag of popcorn Mm -hmm. this could be crackers this could be a slice of a nice whole wheat or multi-grain bread Mm -hmm. um half of an English muffin or a full English muffin, depending on your goals, like Mm -hmm. that could be the carb. And then the fat or the protein could be canned tuna on your crackers. If you're home, this is more work from home luxury. Mm -hmm. If you like canned tuna, that's a wild first example, by the (laughs) way, people are gonna be like, ew. So I I love that. I feel like tuna is like trendy Uh, (laughs) right now. Yeah, me too. Um, That could be another trend like cottage cheese Mm -hmm. with on a piece of toast for a snack, Mm -hmm. Greek yogurt with some berries, Um, a string cheese with a bag of popcorn. That's a really popular one. A lot of patients of mine like one or two hard boiled eggs with an apple. That Mm -hmm. could be another one. But if you're more on the go, this could maybe look like um, nuts that could play as your protein or fat. This could also look like um, there's so many snacks now like dry roasted beans, dry Mm -hmm. roasted edamame, dry roasted chickpeas, whether you make that at home. I'm certainly not doing that. You could buy them in a lot of stores. But that's what that could look like. Again, a protein bar, a protein Mm -hmm. shake, these grab on the go, like plant based if you need plant based or whey if you like whey, like Mm -hmm. shakes on the go. So those bars or shakes are typically a nice blend on their own of they have some carbs some fats Mm -hmm. and protein. They have a little bit of everything, which is great. Mm -hmm. But generally, if you are someone who snacks on you grab a piece of fruit. Great. That's not keeping you full because the carb is quickly digested going right through you. An hour later, you're going to want something else or maybe even sooner. Right. So you want to pair that with something that has protein or fat Mm -hmm. to help keep you feeling full for at least a couple of hours. It's not going to keep you full for days, but Mm -hmm. it's going to give you that two to four hour crutch. Mm -hmm. So the kind of power combo for fullness would be like a carb and a protein. That's typically the power combo. Because especially like I feel like before and you can tell me if this is wrong because obviously I'm not the pro here but isn't it like because carbs like it's protein is like sustainable for longer but carbs give you like the quicker exact energy Mm -hmm. okay everything's gonna help sustain you and give you energy like calories are energy which Mm. we could talk about too but carbs are going to be those quickly digestible fast acting carbohydrates Mm -hmm. that boost of energy you're going to feel that's why you can get a rise in your blood sugar that's right there's nothing wrong with that our blood sugar should rise after we eat an apple whether it's someone with diabetes or without Mm -hmm. but that's what the carb is going to do a high fiber carb like fruit Mm -hmm. or like um a high fiber slice of bread say that's going to cause a little bit of a slower rise and all mm-hmm. of that. So it's going to, again, delay gastric emptying, meaning it'll keep you fuller a little bit longer, mm-hmm. but not enough. So right. the protein, that's what's satiating. Right. Same with fat. It's They both satiate uh-huh. people. The sweet spot, I would say, for most is carb with protein. Yeah. But people love a good apple with peanut butter. Like yes. That's still a, a legendary snack for yeah. a lot of patients yeah, of mine. Yeah, for sure. I, still, I love it too. Even like before a workout, a banana and peanut butter. Yeah power combo for me yeah let's talk a little bit more about um not only just calories but just because I don't I try to stay away from Mm -hmm. talk of like weight calories that kind of thing um just because like a lot of my audience is recovery but I want to talk about eating enough and why it is so important to eat enough so many people when they go into a diet or a lifestyle change and they like want to like lose weight or just maintain weight they stop eating, they, they'll they cut a lot. Mm-hmm. Why is it important that you have enough calories and like enough food throughout the day? And like what will happen if you consistently don't eat enough? Great question. And so, so common, unfortunately. But the first and foremost thing that's just something to always check in on is mm-hmm. how do you feel genuinely mm-hmm. eating when you're undernourished and under fueling? Like Do you have energy? Are you feeling fatigued? Are you experiencing brain fog? Are you just feeling like low mood, low energy, like low? People may argue, 
I feel amazing when they're eating when they're not eating enough. Mm-hmm. And some of them may may dependent. But if you're active and you're also under fueling, mm-hmm. it's going to catch up to you eventually or it's going to be unsafe ultimately. So especially severe under fueling, we want to make sure that you're not at risk for losing consciousness, God forbid, or passing out. That's huge when it comes to especially nutrition with sport Mm -hmm. athletes. Um, When I did some shadowing at Rutgers, this was not that this came up, but a lot of underfueling with athletics Mm -hmm. and it's such a risk in terms of performance, in terms of um, losing muscle mass, bone density at that age too. So it's just really important first and foremost, but metabolically, why so many patients and I'm sure so many people listening also may struggle with that yo-yo in weight mm-hmm. of that 10 to 15 pounds. Sometimes they lose 10, they gain 15. And if that keeps happening, you're actually just gaining over time. Right. And a lot of that is rebound off of under fueling. So you'll try a diet or you'll start cutting really aggressively well below what would be a sustainable cut. Mm-hmm. Um, which is really what my bread and butter I would say is with my sustainable weight loss Mm -hmm. patients is it's so you're you could eat so much more than you think reaching your goals Mm -hmm. it's gonna look slower but if you're starving all the time and you're deprived all the time what are you doing right like what are you doing so I think having that conversation is really challenging but if you're under fueling to such a severe degree and you're cutting calories so so much it's not going to be sustainable and then you're going to completely overdo it and surplus yourself Mm. or for so long, say it's someone who's super disciplined. Like if I had continued on my path Mm -hmm. for more years, you're going to damage your metabolism, which is going to make weight control over time harder, which is why sometimes it's like, I haven't really changed anything. I'm eating a little bit more, but not much. Your metabolism's rocked because it got so used to surviving at such a low intake Mm -hmm. that to maintain that, your recommended intake is now really, really low too. So you're going to gain not eating much either, which is crazy. And that metabolic repair is something that I work a lot with too. The patients who are willing to, it's like the most cool thing of we're going to get you eating more, more, more. We're going to increase really, 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 really slow over like a three to six to nine month period. Mm -hmm. It might take that long. Mm -hmm. We're going to reset your metabolism. Mm -hmm. It's like a diet break. No one likes to do this. <laughs> you know, Nobody wants to do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure no one wants to do it, but probably so many people need to do it. I think yeah. I would probably need to do it. Like after yo-yoing for just so many years, I feel that so hard. And I'm sure so many people listening to this, like I used to, it like used to be so simple for me. I could kind of eat whatever. I, mm-hmm. I thought I couldn't, but I, I looking back, I could. Whereas now I feel like, it's so easy for me to put on weight. It's like my metabolism is so rocked. So how do you like, I mean, you're increasing what people are eating, but like, what does it actually look like when you break it down? Like, is it eating more frequently? Is like, what are some of the things you're doing and adding food? I mean, this might be a whole other subject, but adding foods back in after taking foods out for so long, how are you reintroducing foods. Right. That's why it's so slow. I mean, I'm thinking of a patient in particular. We started with all we added for the first week was a teaspoon, Mm. a teaspoon. For those who don't know what a teaspoon of peanut butter looks like, it's not much. Mm -hmm. And that was added to a morning snack Mm. for a week. Mm -hmm. And once we felt safe there, we added I think the next thing we added was maybe a half of a sweet potato with Mm -hmm. dinners or a half, like a half of a cup of some sort of carbohydrate to Mm -hmm. dinner. So when there's also relationship with food concerns, which most people there are, we can't just give you this data driven numbers plan of like, you need to count everything and you need to slowly, slowly increase, increase. I do have a few patients who do that and Mm -hmm. have a neutral relationship with food and like to see that numerically yeah. kind of like I did historically mm-hmm. and for those it's just easier yeah for them. like yeah. they're seeing their weight not move yeah but they're so slowly with the help of our sessions together and their homework in between it's like right. every week it's like a little bit more uh-huh. until we're still monitoring weight closely if that's a goal and important mm-hmm. and the scale feels safe mm-hmm. for you if that starts to go all over the mm-hmm. place in the upward direction okay we know we've hit the max Mm -hmm. but for a while it's awesome yeah like if you do this slow and steady and it's adding so tiny yeah you're gonna stabilize and then 
sustainably cut uh-huh. a little right now you're gonna hit your goals and it's gonna feel so much better but right. to get there most people won't be willing or they'll start and get really scared so for mm. the people who can't get that data oriented plan they're not going to start counting things super numerically mm-hmm. it's like what you're saying it's very focused very specific of a specific adding something mm-hmm. we have to get your baseline first of right. where we could add and what's that list of foods that you're ready to add mm-hmm. and what's the list of foods that you want to add eventually but you're not safe with right. yet we don't touch those yet mm-hmm. so we'll start with the safer foods we'll build those in monitor closely and then kind of just keep going like, right the more the better yeah as a dietitian why is it important especially with what you've gone through in the past why is it important that your patients that are able to eat all food groups are eating all food groups or feel comfortable eating all food groups so this is really just for making sure they're getting the nutrition that they need from a macronutrient perspective mm-hmm. which is carbs fats and proteins from a micronutrient perspective that's vitamins minerals if we're cutting an entire food group out, mm-hmm. something's missing. Mm. So from just an overall health perspective, mm. um, digestion, mm. we want to be getting a variety of foods. Also, especially with different foods providing different nutrients, that's really important. Um, but really, it's because every type of food gives us something else, whether mm. it's always also nutritionally related, mm. like it's giving you energy, it's giving you satiation, it's giving you fiber. What if it's just making you happy? Because right. food is also so much more than just designed to promote weight control and reach mm-hmm. our goals or eating a certain pattern for X, Y, Z. The satisfaction factor is just from a quality of life perspective. Right. If we are avoiding a food group or avoiding a specific type of food, it's going to likely make social engagements or work events or dating, mm-hmm. family events, like everything's going to be really, really hard for you. And Mm -hmm. what's it all worth? Right. What's it all for? Right. So it's a big nutritional piece of promoting overall health, um, promoting strong bones, promoting immunity, promoting, maintaining muscle mass, especially Mm -hmm. 20s, 30s, 40s plus. We want to make sure that you're eating enough, for example, protein to maintain your muscle. Right. But it's for a quality of life perspective too. There's no reason anyone should be avoiding anything unless Mm -hmm. they're allergic, intolerant, or sensitive. Mm Mm-hmm. How do you know when you're, I mean, I guess people, unless you're getting a food test, should you be avoiding something? I, as I said that, also unless there's a religious reason or a moral reason, if someone yeah. is plant-based or vegetarian, right, right. things like that, or follows a kosher diet. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah. How do you know stomach issues? I mean, that's like, we haven't even talked about that yet now, yeah. but almost everyone who presents with weight loss relationship with food it's like the trifecta I want to lose weight I struggle with disordered eating and I'm bloated every single day all the time like I don't think I tolerate anything yeah and let's (laughs) talk about that too because I remember during the live show you said the funniest thing and I was like this is so accurate how everyone complains about being bloated nowadays and also isn't it like possible too? so many people complain about being bloated but it's like you didn't eat all day and then you're eating this huge salad that would fuck up my stomach like I'd be unwell 100% so it's like like people I I know I'm just telling I'm like talking at you about it you're like I know but it but so many people go online or say to me like I struggle so much with bloating there's all these little things that people are doing and it's so silly to me it's like this is so obviously making you bloated um What are some other things that you see aside from me, just what I just mentioned, like not eating all day and then eating a salad? Like what are some other things that you see people doing, um, especially like in the Gen Z culture, Mm -hmm. millennial area that could be causing bloating that doesn't have to do what they think it has to do with? We can justify first that digestion issues are real. So real. 100%. IBS girly. Yes. Through and through. And for those people who are ready to get to the bottom of things, we will be keeping some sort of journal of your intake. We will be really monitoring your symptoms closely. So for someone who is a New Yorker, Mm -hmm. which a lot of my patients are, who have a thriving social life, Mm -hmm. to try to get to the bottom of their digestion issues is really challenging. Mm -hmm. Um, really for anyone, a busy mom, like anything this could be challenging for. It's like, I can't realistically cut something out or figure this out. 
So I'm just going to kind of get by and yeah. like maybe we can figure that out down the line. So mm-hmm. it's for some people should be their primary goal and they're just unable to really make it their focus. Yeah. Which is challenging. Um, but I think that something for bloating that is important to typically recognize is a lot of the time once we get you eating balanced meals get some structure into your day, get you eating some more fiber, eliminate maybe more of the less nutrient dense foods like fried food or super oily foods. There are certain just common triggers Mm -hmm. that as you start to eat less of, you feel better, Mm -hmm. which is not to say for everyone. But I think that a big thing is what you said. It's like we're not eating regularly enough. So then we have a large quantity of anything and you're full. You're over full. You've eaten past fullness. Mm -hmm. You have some distension. That's food. Right. Is that always the case? No, but that's that's a normal response Mm -hmm. to eating Maybe even not a large quantity. Mm-hmm. Maybe you just had an eaten in a few hours and you ate a meal and you feel full and you feel like a little something going mm-hmm. on in there. Is that a problem? Right. And for a lot of patients, they say, they don't, I don't know. Right. And then it's probably not mm-hmm. a severe gastrointestinal sensitivity or problem. Yeah. yeah. But for some, it really is. Mm-hmm. I mean, dairy is a big one. Yeah. But if you tolerate dairy, please don't cut it out. Mm-hmm. Um gluten I feel like is not as big as it kind of like the fasting like Mm -hmm. no one's really it's not that big to like cut gluten out just for trendiness anymore again the small frequent meals and snacks that structure you're going to eat smaller portions a lot of the time right so you're going to feel better before Mm -hmm. during after meal yeah um I know this is another subject we talked about in the live show but I'm wondering since then if you've noticed do you like scroll TikTok a lot? I don't know. A little. I need to be better. No, I, I the, like have the reason I no ask is because obviously my <laughs> followers are, are TikTok people. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to ask just about any diet trends that you've seen now or even in the last couple of years um, and how we can kind of like bust those myths that they work. Yeah. I mean, yeah. right now, I think this was something we talked about before mm-hmm. we recorded like this whole like nature's Ozempic mm-hmm. or berberine acting as Ozempic. Uh-huh. Um, a lot of de bloat supplements mm-hmm. out there won't name names, mm-hmm. but there's just so many. Mm-hmm. I think that this was mentioned at the show too. Like supplements is mm-hmm. the biggest thing that I see. And like mm-hmm. when you go on TikTok, it's challenge. It's a challenging space. A lot of people are making a living off of promoting a lot of these products, right? And maybe it is really working for them and that's great, but it can get really dicey. Mm -hmm. And as the consumer of the content, it's really your responsibility to, which is hard, like to judge that knowledge, right? And to judge the content for you. Just because I see this person taking this and saying that it's helping them with this does not mean that it's something that I should be doing. I think probiotics is also a big one. Mm -hmm. A lot of tiktokers love probiotics yeah i mean I, my whole life i've taken probiotics right so probiotics and i'm not a gastrointestinal expert right so just right. a general kind of comment i would say with mm-hmm. probiotics is if you experience normal digestion mm-hmm. and there is nothing going on if it ain't broke don't, don't fix, fix it. it a probiotic is billions of microbiota entering the gut and our gut has trillions mm-hmm. so you could argue that's really a drop in the bucket. Why is anyone doing this? Right. For some people, it can help with regularity, with digestion. For other people, it's a placebo. Mm-hmm. They wake up, take their probiotic, drink water, get a workout in, eat their healthy lunch. Right. Oh, it was the probiotic. <laughs> this changed my life. So for a lot of people, it's that. Mm-hmm. Um, and for others, it's probably doing nothing. So right. for people who have, if you're familiar with SIBO of course, or yeah. anything a little bit more drastic uh-huh. when it comes to digestion even arguably ibs there's different strains of probiotics so it's yeah. really important to work with your gastro um your gi doctor mm-hmm. to find the strain that he or she would recommend for your specific need mm-hmm. um and again if there's nothing going on you're good mm-hmm. like there's no need yeah so i think that's you could say that for a lot of supplements yeah. for sure yeah um as far as other trends or other presentations that i get 
still a lot of low carb. Mm -hmm. Everyone's afraid of carbs, yeah. which is really, really challenging, but it's fun to kind of talk about all the time. Yeah. That carbs are really important and we need to be eating them not once not twice all day typically yeah. like almost every time you eat yeah there could I hear or people, should be a carb. I hear people say like oh I had like a carb at lunch so I'm not gonna eat it at dinner I Huge. grew up with my mom saying that yeah um and it's like no you should be actually having a carb with each meal yeah because that's like a part of the it's a part of the balanced plate right for sure it's right. a part of what's gonna help hold you help to reduce cravings over overeating or thoughts around food that's mm -hmm. a big one like I again something's wrong with me I'm addicted to sugar it's mm. actually all I think about all the time especially mm -hmm. at night I'm waking up in the middle of the night eating carbs right that's a problem that's, yeah you're not eating any carbs during the day mm -hmm. sweetie like yeah. we need to give you some carbs yeah. so again it's a really tough mindset shift but that's where working with someone who's literally giving you that permission and giving you the homework and the plan of mm -hmm. here's what we're gonna if if you need that sort of hand holding mm -hmm. here's what we're adding because I know that you like this food you feel safe enough to start there yeah we're gonna do a really small portion but we're gonna do it x days this week with x meal and if you're keeping any sort of journal about what you're eating or how you're feeling a lot of patients love a food and mood journal mm -hmm. of how's my hunger fullness how's my mood how yeah. am i feeling before during after this that could be helpful too can you do a quick explanation of like the hunger scale um and how people can learn to like f feel their hunger and yes. feel their fullness yes so hunger scale ranges from zero to ten um zero being really really ravenous to the point of like you feel like you're going to pass out because mm -hmm. you're so starving I'm sure we've all gotten there I've definitely gotten there like your blood sugar's dropping you're tanking 10 is complete overly full a lot of the times you're so uncomfortable if you're like at a meal publicly or even privately like you need to like literally take your pants off because yeah. you can't <laughs> even breathe and again common presentation to experience either end of the spectrum yeah. at start of working together and then over time we're really zooming in towards well that's zero to two and that's eight to ten where's like the three to seven and even I would argue like three to four is like you're feeling decently hungry like the five to seven is neutral like you could eat you could not and then seven to eight is like you're starting mm -hmm. to recognize the fullness that's where we want to capture it's really not realistic that we're just going to eat neutral all the time yeah. of like I never feel hungry I never feel full I just right. eat a lot throughout the day structurally right. and yeah. um I think that's where we want to lean into of, okay, I think that, I don't know if you've ever heard of a feelings wheel. I mm. did this for, in my own therapy sessions, mm. I used a feelings wheel like a year or two ago and I use it with my patients sometimes. It's like, mm. what words do we associate? It's just a wheel. You mm -hmm. can look it up and it like describes positive or negative or neutral kind of words based uh -huh. on how you're feeling. And it's like, what does zero to two feel like for you? Can mm. you think of a time where you were there? Yeah. Can you think of a time where you were an eight to 10? Some people, like, can you think of a time neutral? Never. Yeah. Or what does slight hunger feel to you? Most people, which is so powerful mm -hmm. and so interesting. Well, if I feel slightly hungry, why would I eat? Mm. Like, I have, it's typically this where the snacking comes in. It's like four or five o'clock, but I have a dinner reservation at seven. Right. I probably felt like a, th a four on the hunger scale, mm -hmm. but I have dinner later. I why would I eat now? Like I That's know so that I'm going to eat out. And then it's also like the other side of the spectrum. Mm. Something like that can happen too. Well, I'm starting to feel full, but I'm really enjoying the meal. Like mm. why would I stop? It's like, okay, well, why would you stop? You're literally eating to the point of feeling physically mm -hmm. uncomfortable, but you also claim to have goals related right. to this. Right. So if we're always eating to the point of over fullness, we're probably eating too much. Yeah. And I always see when I go to dinners, um, I, I go and I'm like very, I'm never ravenous, rarely ravenous because I've worked on like all of this stuff. And it is really powerful when you see other people who are ravenous. like ravenous no, and going insane. And like, you're like, oh, I'm like good. Like I'm going to eat a little bit of the appetizer. I'm going to eat my dinner. I'm going to like have a bit of dessert, mm -hmm. but you like feel good. It's mm -hmm. like a real, it, the, the biggest like game changer for me was that having a pre-dinner snack. And I, I talked about this a bit mm -hmm. in the live show too around like the three or four mark when my blood sugar dips and I'm mm -hmm. feeling a little bit like hangry and a little bit like low energy. I know everyone kind of gets those cravings around mm -hmm. three or four o'clock. That's when I feel like it's been the most powerful for my cravings all day mm -hmm. because it's like when you, you do it out of like avoid, like you do mm -hmm. it because you want to avoid feeling that later. 
Mm -hmm. what do you like recommend for someone who doesn't usually have like a pre-dinner snack and doesn't want to is like oh my god I'm gonna get too full and then not want to eat like what's a good little like snack to like hold you over something little or just anything anything that you would recommend for someone that's like okay I actually don't want to go to dinner ravenous tomorrow night when I go with friends like what can I do so if you don't want to go to dinner ravenous mini meal um if you're someone again who works remotely I love a snack plate That's I love a such snack a great plate. one like a mini little charcuterie My girly favorite snack thing, yes uh, maybe a few slices of turkey or whatever meat you have mm-hmm. a piece of cheese some raw carrots or cucumbers a little spoonful of hummus tzatziki mm-hmm. maybe some grapes that's like delightful. I love that. Um, but if you're someone who's like in an office, you know, you're going to be working late and you're heading to a dinner. Mm-hmm. If there's snacks at your office, like show me them. Mm-hmm. Let's see the options. I love to like raid an office snack cabinet yeah. over yeah. Zoom. It's so fun. But if you don't have that option, what are some portable snacks we can start programming an autopilot that are mm-hmm. always in your bag or you're always stocked on in your office mm-hmm. cabinet whether that's again bars, nuts, yeah. uh, throw a piece of fruit in your bag, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And that could be a helpful bridge yeah I would say. or like a smoothie smoothie is a good a little one. like protein powder or something yeah I love that in the summer like yeah. at a four o'clock before a later dinner out yeah. like I love also volume mm-hmm. this is something we could talk about too yeah. for anyone who loves volume eating that's mm-hmm. huge for me like I need a lot of food in front of me that's yeah. where the snack plate can be that's, helpful that's like I'll cut like this. a whole cucumber on my yeah plate. same because <laughs> I, I think that's a, also a bit of like with for me um, with my emotional eating history, it's really nice because I often eat with distraction. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just what makes me feel more comfortable. But if I'm going to eat with distraction, I want something that I can mindlessly eat. Right. So I'll go in front of my TV, but I'll have my big snack plate of so many cucumbers and carrots and different dips and then some crackers and all different things. And I feel like, and some grapes, like have my little sweet. I think it's a really nice thing to kind of mindlessly eat obviously we all in an ideal world want mm-hmm. to sit and really enjoy our food but you know it's what's achievable yeah for, that's for a great person. tip I think for people it's um it's one that I give all the time um I I relate I kind of especially after a long day of work I want to scroll on my like I haven't scrolled all day yeah. I want some scrolling time yeah. so what can I put in front of me that I can just mindlessly yeah. eat for a decent amount of time and right. be scrolling right for a lot of people that's popcorn too yeah it's I a love really popcorn. nice volume of snack yeah um but the smoothie can be nice I also think for those who like to drink something but mm-hmm. also need a little bit of oral stimulation mm-hmm. that could be a nice like bridge as well can you drink something and maybe eat something so right. maybe you do like a smoothie in the afternoon mm-hmm. with let's say protein powder, your milk of choice, Mm -hmm. and maybe some peanut butter, like a chocolate peanut butter little shake. And then you didn't put, you decided to like keep the fruit on the side. Mm -hmm. You could cut up a banana on the side instead of putting it in or have some berries on the side to like stimulate chewing a little bit. Yeah, or even like sometimes I'll do a smoothie and I'll put some granola on peanut butter. Yeah, yeah, so good. A little bit thicker so that it's giving you a little bit of both oral stimulation, but Mm -hmm. also sipping on something mm-hmm. like best of both worlds. I like what how you're describing like you're using very descriptive words and I think that's such an important thing to mention too for people like when you're learning to like improve your relationship with food, I think feeling is so important and being so in tune with like what you're craving, how mm-hmm. you're how this food makes you feel. Do I want something crunchy? Do I want something chewy? Totally. Cold, hot, like I, I know I've seen um, Victoria Garrick talk about this a bit, mm-hmm. like about like really describing, using very descriptive words to talk about what you're craving. And I think it's super helpful. Um, so for me, it's been something that's really helped with, again, my emotional eating habits. Like definitely thinking to myself, what is going to satisfy me? Um, one last thing I want to talk about. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of sometimes just eating what you're craving instead of a substitution for the craving? Yeah. So if you're craving a cookie, learning to have that those mindful eating habits that you're able to eat just one or two cookies instead mm-hmm. of having the substitute cookie but still feeling not totally satisfied. Yeah, there's a lot of videos on this that dietitians make of like a trickling thought, I would like a cookie right now, but... I shouldn't have a cookie. Cookies are bad for me. So I'm going to have a piece of fruit. Mm -hmm. And then 30 minutes later, I'm going to have some popcorn. Yeah. And 30 minutes later, I'm going to have a string cheese. Yeah. And then I'm going to have some chocolate chips because I still want the sweet craving, but like nothing's doing it for me. Mm -hmm. And then I open the cookies and I have five cookies. And it's like the classic storm, Mm -hmm. I would say. Um, First and foremost, we're never going to be able to mindfully eat 
anything for the most part if we're not eating enough throughout the day, which we've talked so much about, but it's just so important. If you're still restricting, this is going to be so, so challenging. So working on that structure first, getting your intake to a place where you feel in control of your choices Mm -hmm. is the baseline framework has to be there. We have to get to that place. Not Mm -hmm. all the time, but most of the time so that you can really feel the difference too of like today was a weird day. Yeah. Not a bad day. I think that framework adjustment is so important too. Mm. But like I eat so normally well that these days where like the day did get away from me. I forgot a snack in my bag. Lunch Mm -hmm. got pushed late. Like I forgot to eat breakfast. This is crazy. I feel Mm -hmm. so ravenous. Mm -hmm. It was just an off day. You should feel ravenous. It makes sense rather than getting frustrated, get curious. I Mm -hmm. always say like that makes sense. Here we are. Let's try to not make, make sure that doesn't happen again. Right. But Say you've gone to that place, what can we do? The first thing is identify, is this hunger? Am I mm-hmm. thinking about a cookie because I had lunch and it's four o'clock because mm-hmm. this is the classic example too, or like late night with dinner? Uh-huh. Am I thinking about a cookie because my dinner was a little bit lighter than usual? I didn't give myself that nice small portion of a high fiber carbohydrate mm-hmm. and I really just had protein and veggies, which mm-hmm. is the classic, I feel like modernized girl yeah. dinner, like yeah. salmon and veggies, like mm-hmm. you're missing something yeah. and that's why you're craving something afterwards. Right. So say you had that balanced meal and, or say you didn't Mm -hmm. eat mindfully what you're actually craving. It's just going to serve you best Mm -hmm. and you're going to end up net net eating less Mm -hmm. than if you ate all those things before. Right. But if it's like physical hunger is not there, I'm thinking about this cookie. It's your choice. I always say you're in the driver's seat of that decision. It's always okay to eat something when you're not hungry. Yeah. If we can be mindful most of the time. Mm -hmm. If you feel like this has become a habit and you want tools Let's set a timer for 10 to 15 minutes. This is ideal when you're alone. When you're with someone, it can be more challenging, Mm -hmm. but let's just keep it simple. Say you're by yourself. Um, What's that list or that toolbox that you have of things you can do? Is there laundry you could fold? Do you need to take a shower? Mm -hmm. Do you need to call? Did you mean to call your friend, catch up with her, call your parent, call your grandma? That's Mm -hmm. a great one. If God willing, you have a grandma to call. Mm -hmm. Um, Is there something for work that you could quickly check in on? Is there an email you could watch? Is there a show that you wanted to start? Mm -hmm. Do you want to read? Do you want to journal? Pick something. And if 10 to 15 minutes sounds way too long, set a timer for five minutes. Mm -hmm. And after you really do one of those things, check back in. Mm -hmm. And how can we be mindful? Can we go into the kitchen and intentionally and mindfully take one or two, say, cookies, Mm -hmm. close it, leave the environment immediately that can be really helpful don't Uh stand there don't bring the cookie jar the bag to the table and sit at the table and scroll right because that's gonna look different than the cucumbers while we're scrolling yeah but can we set that boundary pretty quickly yeah in whatever way that looks like for you yeah and just clarify too like it is okay to just like if you're having a craving after dinner like a lot of people for me specific like i need something sweet after dinner every night like every night i need something sweet so once you do have that relationship with food where you know you ate what you were kind of like supposed to for the day, like you you had all your nutrients in, it's like perfectly fine to like yes. have that that sweet treat. I we built all need it in. Sweet treat. I call it like a built in bid. Mm-hmm. I didn't make that up. I forgot who made that up. <laughs> but build it in. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. I actually encourage that for Mm -hmm. most people Mm -hmm. unless you get that like weirdo who's like I don't like sweets I don't like chocolate it's like can't really really? (laughs) okay what but for most people that one or two or three depending on your goals and your needs because everyone's different yeah that's actually part of Mm -hmm. the day that's allotted for you right so that you don't feel like you're failing so that you don't feel like you made a bad decision Mm -hmm. because there's nothing negative associated with that yeah and I think just giving again that permission like this is actually part of the plan this is okay right it's like that aha moment people have okay I feel like I can maybe start to trust myself a little mm-hmm. bit and like dabble yeah when people feel like I just want to get into this a little like perfectionism and how people feel like they always need to be perfect mm-hmm. every day of eating or else like everything goes down the drain and then they just like they're like screw it for the day mm-hmm. like How does that end up affecting you worse instead of just if you ate the cookie, just do it and move on, you know, which is I know it's not that simple. Yeah. I think trying to drill into people's brains that there's not one food, one meal, one snack, one moment, one event, one weekend, Mm -hmm. one week that's going to make or break your progress Mm -hmm. and that is 
a challenging pill to swallow because we put so much weight Mm -hmm. on these little moments or these small decisions that we make or don't make. But once you steer away from that perfectionism because nobody's diet should look 100% perfect Mm -hmm. at any time, I still think there's a lot to be said for the 80-20. I still reference that Mm -hmm. for those who aren't familiar with that. Like 80% of the time, you're making pretty nutrient-dense choices. You're following a general structure that works for you. Mm -hmm. But you have a life. You Whether that's dating, family, friends, birthdays, celebrations, vacations, Mm -hmm. bachelorette parties. Like there's so much that could be going on. The the thought that you're going to just stick with your plan Mm -hmm. for all of those things and have no room for flexibility Mm -hmm. is wildly unrealistic and it's going to constantly let you down and then you're going to want to restrict and then it's going to like be cyclical. So what we can do is strategize that 80% of the Mm -hmm. time plan that you feel really confident about and sprinkle slowly for those who are maybe just getting out of like ready to leave their isolation because mm-hmm. they're trying to be perfect all the time. Right. We have to sprinkle that slowly yeah. if you're ready when you're ready, but gotcha. it can be really tough yeah. to get that point across. Mm-hmm. Well, we are out of time, but thank you. I could like talk to you for hours about this <laughs> stuff. I'm like, you'll have to come on again, <laughs> but um, thank you so much for coming on. Tell everyone where they can find you. Thank you so much for having me. This was awesome. Um, I'm on Instagram at pages underscore plates and a slow but steady growing TikTok. I almost Mm -hmm. have 85 followers. So I hope someone listening is 85. (laughs) (laughs) But it's the same. I think it's pages plates RD on TikTok. Um, And that's where everyone can find me. I also, like I said, work for Kulina Health. The link is in my bio on Instagram. If you are struggling with anything that you think I could help you with or you want a cheerleader, a coach, a support system, um, come find me. Come find her. Well, thank you guys for listening. Please give this video a thumbs up on YouTube if you haven't already. Uh, give this a five star rating and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Find me on Instagram at Real with CW and TikTok at Real with Carly Weinstein. And I love you guys. And I will see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye, guys. What a wonderful.